Hi everyone, what's up? Chelsea fans, I hope you're all feeling good. This is Xavier Mbuyamba, and you're listening to the Blue Day Podcast. Enjoy. Hello Chelsea supporters, here at the Blue Day podcast, I am delighted to welcome this individual on the show today. He is a man who 50 years ago this month was part of the 1971 Cup Winners' Cup victory against Real Madrid, plus he made 266 appearances for the club scoring 12 goals. He truly is an unsung hero at Chelsea Football Club. Here is John Boyle. John, welcome to the Blue Day podcast. How are you? Thank you very much, Keith. I'm doing very well. I'm enjoying myself. Superb. Hopefully with the lockdown restrictions easing off as well, the country's starting to get back into the swing of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's been a strange old year, hasn't it, for everybody. It's been um, hard work and um, strange things have happened, but we're, um, we're all here today and that's what's important. Absolutely. I completely concur with that. John, we're going to start off by sort of talking about your career, from the early days all the way up to your last appearance for Chelsea and obviously talking about current events. But I'd like to take all the way back to the beginning. And I've asked this question to a few other of my ex-guests. Who influenced you to become a professional footballer? Um, there wasn't any individual, but where, where I come from in Scotland is, is, is a fantastic football area. Um, I come from a little place called Wisher which is in, in a district called Lanarkshire. And it is probably in the 60s or early 60s, it was probably one of the greatest um, areas for footballers that, that, that played in that area. And I, I, I was lucky enough that I, I went to a great school, um, a ladies' high school in Motherwell. And um, former pupils a couple of years before me were Billy McNeil and Bobby Murdoch. Right. So, um, and they had won the European Cup with Celtic. And then also there was, um, I, I played with some guys who were friends with Jimmy Johnson. Um, and then people like Joe Baker, um, some, yeah, some great footballers, Tommy Gemmell, who came from the same area as me. So the area I came from was just a great footballing area. And we played from sort of out in the field in front of us um, from morning to night in the, in the district where we lived, in the, out in the cow, cow field or um, in the front, yeah. So that's where it all started. And then I, then I, 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 I joined my school. Had a, a school team. I've got a great picture somewhere, but I'm, I'm one day I'll get it. But uh, and uh, I've, I've was in an under eleven team, and um, I've been in touch with a couple of the guys lately through Facebook. It's been great. And we won. Then I went to to this good school, um, and we won the Scottish Schools Under Fourteen Cup, which was a great achievement. And at the same time, I also played for for an amateur team in in my little town, and um, we also won the Scottish Under Sixteen Cup. And I was still under fifteen, in, um, in so which was another, I think, another great achievement then. But I, around about that time, I was just getting ready to leave school at fifteen. And I wasn't very bright. <laughs> I went to I, I passed my eleven plus, but I wasn't very bright when I went got to the secondary school. They had they had a, a a form one one a one b one c one d one e, and I um I went in in one d. Um, they also had a one f, but that, I'll tell you about that in a sec. Uh, but one d was um was, wasn't very good, so I I failed my exams that you sit a year failed my exams, and I went to one f. So so you, I did one d one f, and then so what's called the repeat class. So I then went, got to two d. And then I got to 2F. <laughs> so that was my four years at school. And I got Latin and French and everything. And um, But six months later, I was in the changing room for the rest of the world versus England. I was standing in the dressing room when they had Lev Yashin, Jaume Santos, uh, Eusebio. And over in the corner, um, there was 
I had a voice. I was the kit boy at Chelsea by then. And over in the corner, I had little voices shouting, hey, boys, get the kit out here. And it was Dennis Law and Jim Baxter. And I looked around and it was, wow. I mean, I was like in heaven, you know. So yeah. Then. But before then, what happened was that how, how I ended up coming was that my uncle lived in Battersea, my mum's stepbrother. And he said he, he, he was connected to some Tommy Doherty through a cousin or second step cousin or something. So he phoned up and asked when the trials were. And uh, <clears throat> they said, oh, they're in July. So I left school in June and, and we got the train down in July for the trials and I, I came over to Stamford Bridge with my boots. I walked in and they said, oh yeah, we're going, we're going to Hendon. So they took us over to Hendon to the training ground on Saturday morning and uh, we played a game and after the game they said, yeah, we want you to stay. <laughs> so I had to phone my parents up in Scotland. My dad was working at the dog track so I had to phone my parents up and say, you know, I'm staying in London. I'm going to come and stay in London. So then we went home and a, a couple of weeks later, we got um, tickets and stuff from Tommy Doherty. And uh, that was me. That was, well, yeah, when I was 15 and a half. Um, and my, my parents then put me, put me on the train at Motherwell to London. Great story. How was you feeling when it came down to signing that contract for Chelsea when you was that particular age, knowing that, you know, your Roots were in Scotland, and then you had this great opportunity to sign for Chelsea. Yeah, it was. I mean, to me, it was. It was like the greatest adventure ever. I didn't realise how good it would turn out. But um, I mean, on the train, the tra- on the train journey it was funny because I, I went in and they put me into a restaurant car, first class, and I sat down for 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 dinner. And this, there was a serviette. There, there was a serviette, four 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 forks, four knives, two big spoons, and and then they handed me a. A menu. I mean, I'd hardly seen a menu in my life. Um, I, and they looked at the menu, and I wasn't a very good eater. And the um, I looked and it said soup, and I said asparagus soup, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll have that. My mum makes soup, I'll have that. And it came down, and to this day, when I smell the asparagus soup, I'm still sitting on the train. I ended up eating. The guy looked, just gave me the menu again, said, you know, have what you like. And I, it, it said apple pie, custard, and ice cream. So I said, can I have the three of them? He said, yeah, of course. So that day on the train down, I had three apple pie custard and ice creams and a cheese sandwich. <laughs> then I arrived at Euston and I got off the train and there was the crew-headed Tommy Doherty waiting there for me. Brilliant. And so that was it. That's how it started. And uh, and then Tommy Doc became sort of like such a, uh, a person in my life. It was amazing. You know, he looked after me so, so well, the man. What was he like as a coach? Um, as a coach, I don't know. He was that great. As a, as a man manager, he was brilliant. Um, that's why I always think that him and, and, and Dave Sexton sort of got on so well. Um, because, because I mean, if Tommy Dock had said to me when I was sort of like going into the team, like, oh, we've got you sort of knocked down that wall. I said, okay, when do we start? Um, it was just that way. With, with, I don't know with everybody, but I know that, yeah, with me, I was, I would have done anything for the man. He was just so good to me. You made your debut for Chelsea in quite an important game. It was the League Cup first leg against Aston Villa. It was a game where you you actually scored the winning goal. I've just got to cut the questions in relation to this. When did you know that you'd be in the squad, and what was going through your mind after scoring in your debut? Well, I'll tell you the, the, the story about, about how my debut occurred. What happened was that I, I was playing in the reserves on Saturday at Fulham. And then on the Monday, I had uh, my one and only trial of recognition with, Scott, with the Scottish uh, youth team. I played a trial in Scotland on the Monday. So that was the Saturday I played in Fulham. On the Monday, I played. Tommy Doherty told me on the Monday or Tuesday I was going to Aston Villa. So I went to Aston Villa on the Wednesday and made my debut, and um, which was just, I mean, for not just amazing. I didn't have time to think. I'd been up to Scotland and back. And, and um, yeah, the game was great. After about 20 minutes, I tackled a guy, Barry Stober, and um, I injured him, and he got carried off. So the crowd then booed me for the rest of the game. 
and it was it was great fun. I, I I was really enjoying it. It was January and the the ground was a bit icy, a bit muddy, and it was just it was great fun. I just enjoyed it so much. Then there was about fifteen minutes to go, and I got the ball um, thirty twenty five yards out or something, and rolled it forward and took a shot, and it flew into the top corner of the net. <laughs> and it proved one thing. I think in in football you need skill, luck, and skill, dedication, and luck. And that time, that that was my bit of luck. It flew into the top corner of the night. And I remember Terry Venner was running up to me and saying to me, oh, John, I'm really, really pleased for you. And I said, oh, great. You know? <laughs> so that was it, 3-2. So that's what happened then. The next day, on the way back to to London, Tommy Doctor said, oh, by the way, you'll probably be playing at Leeds on Saturday. We were at the time top of the league, and we were second top. So... I came home on the, on the Thursday and on the Friday I then had to travel to Leeds to play against Leeds up at Leeds. So on those just, those three, uh, sorry, go on, yeah. No, I was just I was just going to say just for the purpose of the listeners. Obviously, we was talking about your debut. It was in January of 1965. There was 65, the yeah. yeah 1965. The game against Villa was on the 20th, and the game you've just mentioned against Leeds was on the 23rd. So massive yeah. week for you. In, in 1965, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but a week later, we then played West Ham in the Cup. But That's I played right. against Charlton. I played against Charlton for, against Charlton in the Wednesday for the youth team. And then on the Saturday, we had to go to West Ham and play them in the Cup. They, they were already the Cup winners. And the thing, the great thing I remember that was it was the day that Churchill got buried at Churchill's funeral. So what we had to do, we had to have a police escort from Chelsea, Stamford Bridge, all the way down to West Ham. And we had to go through, all the way through Westminster, where all the crowds were. We were on the coach. As I say, I'm 18 and this is London. And, and I'm on the coach and, and we've got six police outriders driving us all the way down to, through Westminster, down the embankment to, to West Ham, where we beat the cup winners as well. Wow. In that game against West Ham, I've, I've just I've just got the uh, team sheet up actually, uh, John. And you you played with some sort of iconic names of English football in regards to coaching and playing. So I just want to sort of run off just a few. You've got the likes of Terry Venables, who who you've mentioned, George Graham as well. What was George Graham hasn't been sort of mentioned too much on the, the podcast, and in fact, his name hasn't sort of been mentioned too much as in regards to Chelsea. What was George Graham like as a person? And as a player, <laughs> you must have heard the stories. Uh, <laughs> George... <laughs> Actually, George and Terry took me took me over to, to Tottenham Court Road when I was about eighteen. Over to um, I think it was a guy called Bill Martin or somebody's um, record place. They were just they were great. They were wonderful to me. Then when I went on my first holiday um, at eighteen, George said, come on, we'll go on holiday. And he took me on holiday. It was like going on holiday with James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was the smoothest character I ever know. Every time I see him, whenever I see him, I say he taught me everything I know off the field. Um, yeah, he, he was a great lad, George. And, and yeah, great. They were, they were great lads, George and Terry, and great, great players and still are, yeah. Um, and I remember when, what happened is, well, when we went on our holiday, we actually ended up meeting Billy McNeil, Ian St. John and Paddy Crerm. Oh, wow. On our holiday. Yeah, yeah. So again, me being a Celtic supporter, I was again in heaven, <laughs> sitting here drinking with, with Billy McNeil and Paddy Crerm. But uh, it was, yeah. yeah. So yeah, George was great. And uh, yeah, Terry, Terry was like superb. I just, I just remember, when you said I was thinking about them, and I, went, I remember going to Terry's wedding way back and I remember thinking I bought him a duvet. <laughs> It's the fault that counts. Yeah, of course, absolutely. No, they were they were they were they were, they were unknown then. I think it was it was a, it was a new thing. <laughs> Did he say thank you afterwards? Though that's the main thing. Oh, of course. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little <laughs> story again about sort of um, what happened. And you know, when I tell it, yeah. So I I was driving when Terry got the job for the English FA. I was driving up by Paddington 
and he, he was going down to the FA Ward. I remember pulling my car up and I jumped out of my car, parked it on the yellow line, jumped out of my car right beside me, wondered what was happening. And I ran up to him and I said, Terry, I'm so pleased for you. And he looked at me, John, what, what, what are you doing? I said, do you know, I remember, I said, when I scored my first goal, I said, I said, you said to me, I was really pleased. And I said, I'm really pleased for you. I said, but I said, I won't be cheering you on because you're an English manager when you play Scotland. And just that was it. And got in my car and I had to drive away. At least you returned the favour, though, all those years well, later. Absolutely, yeah. I would say it was, uh, yeah it was, uh... Brilliant. A couple of months after your debut, um, Chelsea won the League Cup after beating Leicester over two legs. A great achievement by Chelsea at that time. They weren't a side that was renowned for winning trophies. Do you remember much about that cup final? Um, not actually about the game, but I just remember that at the time we were kind of, um, I think we were kind of going for three trophies, weren't we? Um, a lot of people forget it because we, we were in the League Cup final. Chelsea were in the semi-final of the FA Cup and we were second top of the league. And um, so therefore we were kind of, it was like game for game. I don't know if you ever look at the, the list of games that we had to play. I've, I've got it in the list somewhere, but the list of games that we had to play from 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 the game that I started, the list, the amount of games we played to the end of the season, I don't know if you can count them up, but it was an amazing amount of games from mm. when I made my debut to the end of the season. There are quite a number of games, actually, to be fair. Yes, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, so so it seemed mm. to me at the time, those times, same, I think the following season as well, in 66, it seemed to me like we were in the late things of everything, the semi-finals, and there was always lots of games being played. And um, yeah, it was, they were great seasons. I mean, and that, that was a great team. I mean, like when I came in, I mean, they were, I sort of came in with them. Um, I think there were three youngsters who, who came through of sort of like the same time. And that was Aussie, Jim McCallie of himself. And Jim left a year sort of later, we came through that year. And, and, and as I say, that, that that's why we got lots of chances as well, because the, there was lots of games. A lot of the games, it was on a Saturday and then midweek, Saturday, midweek. So you, there was, as you say, quite a lot of games to go through. You mentioned Terry Venables earlier. He was the captain at the final. You've mentioned, obviously, what he was like as a person and off the field. On the field, for those that perhaps only remember him as the England manager and as top the manager or more of a football personality. What was he like as a, as a captain and overall leader of a dressing room? Yeah. Yeah. He was a great captain, a great leader. And, and there's a big fuss made about how he, how he tried to take over and stuff like that. I don't think he ever, ever told me how to play. He never, never dictated things. He, well, there was too many people who could speak up, um, I never found that at all. I had people saying him and Tommy Doherty cross words, and I just don't think that Tommy Doherty fancied him as a player. Um, I think that Terry was a, a, a more of a skillful midfield player than uh, than sort of say like me. You know, what I mean, like so. Sort of, and Tommy Doherty probably liked somebody like me who played who was very similar to Tommy Doherty. Um, and I think that that when when I was talking about those games, um, we lost. A couple of semi-finals those times. I think um, Sheffield Wednesday and um, and Barcelona, um, and we lost at Liverpool as well in the league. And I remember thinking at the time that that was one of the reasons why Tommy Doherty didn't fancy Terry. And it's really strange because I looked up how many trophies Terry won. Do you know how many he won? I don't on the top of my head. No, two. 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 The 65 League Cup and the 67 Cup Final. <laughs> and that yeah. was against Chelsea as well. Well, of course, yeah, that's yes. what I'm saying. Yes, that, that, that's yes. Just, um, they, they just interested me the other day when I was I spoke about it and I was talking about it. I thought, oh, I'll just check, you know. Um, yeah. I was going to ask this question later on, but as we're sort of on the topic of Terry Venables and Tommy Doherty. The the incident that I've sort of spoken to a couple of people about, Alan Hudson, I've spoke to oh, about, about it as well. In the bowling alley? The Blackpool incident. 
in regards in to the bowling alley, wasn't it? in the bowling alley. <laughs> <laughs> What were your thoughts on, on this? Because obviously afterwards it was in the, it was a, a lot was made about it in, in the press about Tommy Doherty falling out with these players and then these players not playing for the club again. For those that maybe are not, are not aware, have a look on YouTube or Google, for example. There will be, I think there's still information on that. But John, at, at the time, obviously you was quite an integral part of the squad. What was your take? on what happened and the aftermath that ensued? Well, it's all kind of fairly, fairly simple. They'd been out and it was, it was I don't know what happened. There's an argument what night it was, but they shouldn't have been out anyway. And they went out and they came back in and, and the, the, um, the night porter sort of said something to somebody and they went to Tommy. The funny story is Tom, Tom tells his part of the story. Tommy Tom tells his part is the he said, no, the boys are not out. And the porter said, yeah, they were. And so the manager took him into the bedroom. And as they were in the bedroom, they looked, Johnny Hollins and George Graham were in bed. Tommy Locke said, look, they were, in, they were in bed. They pulled the covers back and they were still in their suits. <laughs> <laughs> and shirts and ties. Um, whether Tom should have sent them all home, I don't think so. I think he should have kept it quiet, find them all and got on with it. But, um, and then it's a... Um, I mean, there's just so many funny stories because what happened was that as the lads were going back on the train, when they were sent home, they were going back on the train. And when they were coming into Houston, somebody, you know, the old trains, they pulled the window down and said, looked out and said, there must be somebody famous on the train. So why is that? They said, well, there's about 40 photographers waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so they all stepped off the train and suddenly they were the story. And, uh, and they, 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 they were quoted as saying that they've been discussing tactics in the bowling alley. So it's always the bowling alley story. And I had the story later on. Quite, I can't remember parts of it, but I, apparently I, I was sharing a room with Jim McCallion and we were both young, good, sensible Scottish lads. Um, we had an early night and we came down in the morning and, and um, there was nobody, nobody in, in the eating room. <laughs> what has happened? Harry made us, you know, they've all been sent home. <laughs> we said, what? What for? No, um, as I say, I, I just think it should have been quiet. I'm sure that there are other incidents that have happened at the club that have been kept. Well, I know there are other incidents that happened at the club that have been kept quiet. Maybe one day over a drink, I'll tell you about them. Um, I'll look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> John, you made your European debut for the club. It was a nil-nil draw with Roma. It was in the Fairs Cup, which um, was a competition that was around in the 60s and 70s. Describe to the listeners for us the feelings for you to play in Europe against the likes of, against AC Milan and Barcelona. Again, what what had happened to us at Chelsea when we were young, we we went on on, on, uh, Easter tours every year. And two or three of them we went to and it was great because you played against German teams and I remember we actually played against Roma in the under 18s in in Cannes and we also played against Ajax as well where Johan Cruyff was playing so we kind of knew I, I kind of knew a lot about not a lot but I knew that, that there were different kinds of players and they had superb skills and they all looked good and uh, but and so yeah so, so then going to play I mean and, uh, you know sort of watch it on television all these Superstars like from Italy, and it was great. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, just looking forward to it. It was great. It must have been good for you to test yourself against you know top quality opposition, the likes of what Barcelona had to offer and the Milan, you know. And yes, obviously, in, in those days, it didn't matter, of course whether or not it was the Fairs Cup or a friendly. These were still great players playing against Chelsea that you wanted to beat. Yeah, I kind of decided that after my second game at Leeds, I thought if I can come to Leeds and, and play against them, um, I could go and play anywhere. Uh, so so that was it. I remember, as I say, walked off the field. And um, yeah, to, to, and I remember uh, we ended up um, playing against them. Um, but... When people say to me about who was the best players you ever played, we actually played uh, uh, in a friendly, an AC Milan, Inter Milan select. In, it was a business week in, in Milan, a business week in London. They kind of changed things over. And so they asked us to go and play in Milan. 
Um, the forward line for Milan for that Milan team that day was uh, Jair from Brazil, Sandro Mazzola from Italy, Angelo Sormani, who was the most expensive player in Italy, Luis Saris from the Argentine, and Amarildo from Brazil. Um, so when people say about the best players, like that, that's they're all, and I, I don't really say who's the best because they're all the best. They're, I mean, just uh, I, it's. Um, that's quite a good caliber of players to face all in one game. One game, it was. Yeah, you just I mean, like. Um, oh yeah, and the left back was um, was Fichetti of, of Milan, and they took him off and put uh, Schnellinger from Germany on, who, who was in the German World Cup team, and they took off Suarez and put on Rivera. And there's a story about Rivera when we played Milan. Tommy Doherty said to me, he "said John, he said." What well, when you did that is Mark Rivera. <laughs> Thanks very much, Gal. <laughs> and he said, but if ever he goes, if he said, even if he goes to the toilet, he said, I want you to follow him there. <laughs> and uh, so that was my job for the evening was to mark Gianni Rivera. Fantastic. Um, in 1967, sort of fast forward just a little bit, Tommy Doherty left Chelsea and Dave Stexton took permanent charge of the team. What were your thoughts on this decision? And did you believe at that time it was the right one? Yeah, I didn't actually know Dave. Dave had been in charge. I was actually in the team when Dave was there. He'd left, I think, just... I knew him, obviously, of being in the reserves and stuff like that. But I didn't actually know him, know him at all. And um, so I kind of... Um, I, I, I knew he was good. And, and I knew that, that it... it the guys were talking about it and that's something that they wanted. Yeah, and I was I was happy with that. Yeah, definitely, yeah. In the 1969-1970 season, Chelsea finished third in the league and reached the FA Cup final. Unfortunately, you was unavailable for large parts of that particular season due to injury. How frustrating was this for you, knowing that with Chelsea performing well and having some great players, the likes of Houseman, Osgood, Hudson, etc. What were your thoughts on uh, this particular period of your career? Well, like, like anybody's career, when you're injured, it's, it's, it's the, the old feeling of, um, of, of what can you do? What, what, what can you do? And, and you, you just think to yourself, okay, you just, just keep going and trying your hardest and, and, and knowing that every day, and, and, and it's not as if you're, going to work hard somewhere you, you're going to still get into training and doing stuff and and all that so you just have to take that with you again as i said to the beginning it's skill dedication and luck and um i think it all happens well luck yeah most people you came back from injury the next season which we will sort of talk about quite in depth how determined was you by this point, to keep your place in the side, knowing that Chelsea were doing very well in both league and cup? Well, I was never really determined to, to keep my place. It was something that, that, that I did from the very beginning. I just went out and I tried my hardest. And if that wasn't good enough, there's not a lot more I could do about it. Um, that was all I never, ever thought. And that was one of the good things because it, it didn't ever matter where I played. I, mean, I don't know if you've got my list of... of positions and what numbers I wore you was quite it versatile never ever, it never ever bothered me you know somebody said what number did you wear and I said it didn't matter I said as long as I had a shirt it was important not the number and um, so yeah no I never ever thought I'll try harder I, I mean I had a cartilage operation when I was 16 I think and I, I came back in about six weeks I think at the time it was probably the fastest of all that that same season, Chelsea participated in the Cup Winners' Cup tournament. What was Stamford Bridge like to play in, especially at European nights when we were playing the likes of Club Bruges and Manchester City in the later rounds of that competition? Well, again, for, for me, it was it was um, some, something that I'd seen before. I mean, the, the the night we played Milan at Chelsea was was phenomenal. They were they, they were great. So to me, I was already looking forward to that because the whole atmosphere it becomes a whole different atmosphere um, at the stadium. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, how can you not want to play? Um, you, it's just something you love love to look forward to. 
Do you think that experience for you, as you say, when you played in the Fairs Cup, do you think that helped you personally with this particular competition, knowing that there were players for Chelsea that hasn't played in Europe before? Well, well, I, I don't, didn't know. I think talk too much about them. I just thought that, that, that myself, I've been there. I, I know sort of kind of what to expect and, and, and sort of things that happen in the game and things you should and shouldn't do. Um, and obviously, you, you passed that on to, to whoever hadn't been there before, you know, and just sort of told them sort of simple things. You know, what, you know, to take your time when you're winning and, sort of, and don't, don't go too near the crowd when the ball goes out of play. The semi-finals against Man- Manchester City, we won the first leg 1-0 for a goal by Derek Smedhurst, which not many people before we sort of covered this particular era remember. Do you have any Derek Smedhurst stories that you, you can share with us? Um, <laughs> I don't know. No, um, yeah, no, I love Smith. He's great. I, I absolutely adore him. He... Um, He's great. Well, I don't, he's, he's told you the story, hasn't he? When he came to Scotland, because um, after after the Euro he game, mentioned a holiday. Yes, yeah. He 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 was he was going to stay in London, and, and I said to him, "Come to come to stay with me in Scotland." And we went to Scotland, and um, there's a local team, and we 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 said that, "Oh, let's let's go and play for the local team." And we had to play another team, and we didn't tell them that we had we had a, they had a couple of ringers till sort of three quarters of the way through the game and uh, we finally told them Derek had scored about six goals or something and they were looking thinking that they were playing against Pelly because he was all tanned as well but he uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we had a good laugh about it and it was great yeah now it was great fun for us nice for, it was nice for us and great for him to sort of to come come to Scotland and uh, we still laugh about it now and he used to wear he used to wear his Jesus sandals and they hadn't been seen in Wish or ever so uh <laughs> That's the quickest I've ever seen him. I think we came out of a pub one night and I see him running. And it was the quickest he's ever run in his 100 yards and his sandals. But good lad, good lad. In regards to the final itself, after beating Manchester City, we was up against Real Madrid. In regards to the game itself, what was sort of going through your mind from a personal point, knowing that this was a European Cup Winners' Cup final against arguably the best team in, in the world at that point in, in Real Madrid? Just sort of describe to the listeners, if you can, at that particular period, you know, your thoughts about that particular Real Madrid side and what your thoughts were in regards to the chances of beating Real Madrid. Well, up to last week, I thought Real Madrid were always the best team in the world. But when they played Chelsea this year, they weren't nowhere near it. Um, no, um, my Real Madrid story goes way back to, to 1961, I think it was, when they played the European Cup final at Hamden Park and they beat Eintracht Frankfurt 7-3 and it was the greatest football game that's ever been played in Scotland. And the forward line that day for, for Real Madrid was Canario del Sol di Stefano Puskas and Gento. And after the game, my mates and I ran out into our little sweet cow field and nothing. And I think I was del Sol and my mate was uh, Puskas because he had a good left foot and somebody else was a left wing, so he was Gento. And that was us. We were Real Madrid. We'd forgotten Celtic Rangers, Motherwell, Hearts. We, we were now Real Madrid. Um, and 14 years later, to, to sort of be going to Athens and, and, and standing opposite me is this <laughs> number 11 Gento is just bonkers, complete and utter like, crazy stuff. You did play in both games. The first game, unfortunately, went to uh, a draw, had to, had to go to a replay. Just want to sort of get your perspective on sort of the Chelsea side at that point in the final. What was the mood like in the dressing room? Do you remember? And what was there a lot of nerves going into it? Or was there more confidence knowing after the first leg, sorry, first first game, be drawing against Real Madrid that the second game we can end up being victorious. Oh yeah, but we also felt that before the first game. I mean we weren't no. we, we weren't afraid. I, well, I, was, I, I I just always felt that we did, that we were capable of playing anybody. I, I, it's one of the things I because I we we went to Liverpool and won and Old Trafford and won and sort of whole stuff for that. So it didn't really that part didn't bother me. And again then the second game we thought well, well 
they did beat us. So let's, we're going for it again. It wasn't a, 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 and I must have played so well that they didn't play Ghent in the second game. He came on as a sub. <laughs> so, so you've got to know the story when he came on as a sub, don't you? you know the story now? No, I don't know the story. Well, when he came on as a sub, he he, he, he came on and, and when he got onto the pitch, he realised he had his watch on, his wrist. So my mate Alan Adson tells the story. He said that it's a... And suddenly the ball was played to him and he got the ball and he started running down the wing and I started chasing him. And he stopped, took his watch off, <laughs> threw, it, threw it to the touch line and kept going and I still hadn't caught him up. And he was 38 at the time. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you must have been quite based on that story you must have been quite relieved at the final whistle when Chelsea ended up winning the game through goals by John Dempsey and Peter Osgood yeah obviously Aussie, Aussie was a great goal wasn't it I mean he, he, he did them all his life but um, but um, John Canton uh, Dempsey was, um, was the greatest volley I've ever seen um, yeah, was, uh, that was just wonderful for somebody like John to to do that in the European Cup final. Is is one. he's got some lovely stories about it as well, John. He's, he, but lovely lad, great, great. With so much admiration from what he did after when he finished playing football. He 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 became a carer for people. A lovely, lovely man, and so pleased for him. Yes, we had John on the show, sort of quite recently and he was telling us some great stories about this particular era and again sort of talking about the great characters in in the Chelsea side that became great friends off and on the pitch yeah well well yeah well obviously it, it, and it, it kind of depended where you lived as well I mean but I am um, yeah I was I was good mates with Aussie and stuff like that but then I had gone to America as well and um, yeah, it's lovely. I mean, it was lovely. I spoke to Charlie the other day. I spoke to Tommy Baldwin. Nice to talk to them, you know. It's good. Of course. Looking back with this particular achievement of winning the Cup Winners' Cup with Chelsea, where does this rank in your list of accomplishments as a pro footballer? Oh, yeah, obviously. Obviously, it's, it's, it's the best, the best it's the best ever been. I'm just grateful that, that I was lucky enough to, to have done any of it. You know, I'm just, I'm a lucky young man that, that, that turned left and something happened. So, and, and, and it's great that sort of 50 years or 60 years later, we're still talking about it. Yes, of course. John, just wanted to fast forward, if I can, to 1972. Um, Chelsea released the single Blue is the Colour, which is still being played at Stamford Bridge to this day, all these years later. What were your memories of being part of the squad for the recording? Yeah, yeah, it was it was great fun, a great day. It was, um, and when we went on, we went on to the top of the pops when they recorded White City, and um, we all went over to the White City and they, they in the morning, and um, they they said to us, well, what, what clothes are you wearing? And we said, well, just what we're wearing. And they said, oh, no, you all need to wear the same. We said, so they went, sent out and they, they brought back 16, I don't know if you remember, Val Dunigan, 16 Val Dunigan sweaters. And they were like pale blue, I think. It was crazy. So they put us up on stage and said, well, you don't have to sing, but you have to mind, you have to look like you're um, singing. So um, we all stood up there and it was like a cat's choir. Yeah. <laughs> so Eddie McCready, the guy said, well, what's going to say? He said to Eddie, Eddie said to him, mate, he said, there's a favour. He said, go and get four crisps of lager, three bottles of vodka, he said, and a case of Cokes. And uh, so that was it. So we had a session lunchtime and went back in the afternoon and couldn't get them off the mic. There was all up there, They're like Frank Sinatra, mate, up the front singing their heads off. But a great day out, you know, it was, it was great fun. Brilliant. It's great that Chelsea sort of still recognise the efforts of that particular side and also having that particular tune being played. And it, it must feel quite special for you as well to sort of to be part of that, knowing, again, as you say, all these, all these years later and... Chelsea fans, young and old, 
are singing it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's that's funny, but, but, but when you when you tell people you were on top of the pops and they say, "Oh yeah, what for?" and you go, "Blue is the colour," <laughs> and they go, "Oh no." <laughs> Well, it could be worse. It, 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 it could be a lot worse. Um, a year later in 1973, we're sort of going through sort of like the dark period of Chelsea. Chelsea's fortunes begin to change. The league campaign's quite a bit of a downer. It's very inconsistent. There's issues between Dave Sexton and Peter Osgood. Alan Hudson isn't happy. There's issues in regards to the money that has been not spent on the first team, but it's been spent in redeveloping the ground. Why do you personally think Chelsea were going through this difficult period in being in the dressing room at that, at that time? Um, I, <laughs> it's probably a lot, it's probably too long a story to dream in Dubai. But I, <laughs> I think that, that our pre-season training from for 71, 72, I think it was, yeah, it wasn't the best pre-season. And we had just, we all thought we were European champions and we thought we were probably the greatest. And and I, yeah, I I, 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 I just believe that most of the players should take, you know, look at themselves, you know, why things happened. It wasn't, I don't know that it was, I particularly blame one person or two people, but I think the players have got something to answer for. And I think they had a problem with players as well and on who, the kind of players that they had, they, they ended up with a lot of players, I think, that were similar to each other. You know, like like Stevie Kemba, lovely fellow, but, you know, there was John Hollins, Alan Hudson, myself. Why would you need Stevie Kemba? Or even Keith Weller, you Charlie Cook and stuff like that. And I tend to think that there's... And that kind of just crowded the situation, you know, um, because we had kind of players, instead of, I don't know, maybe I, I kind of think that if they'd been out and bought so a really, really good player who, but it didn't, to me, it didn't seem to happen. And then obviously the people got transferred out as well, which, which was probably part of the whole thing. And then there was the, the, the money in, from the, I didn't know too much about that because I wasn't really, I, I was, I mean, I left in 73. So it was kind of a strange season for me as well. But um, that's where I kind of believe it, it kind of started was, um, we went on a, pre-season tour and it wasn't the greatest fitness sort of week that we ever had so that's when in in your eyes the wheels started to come off just a little bit Chelsea were doing so well 1970 win the FA Cup 71 you win the Cup Winners Cup and then all of a sudden it just creeps in a little bit of doubt and a little bit of issues hit here and there well, yeah. If you if you let your 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 percentage drop, then and if every a few people do that, then that happens. Yeah, I, that, that to me. And, and you know, you can't each time you win something, you've got to think again. We're going to try harder again. Um, and I don't know that that we all did that. I would like to discuss your departure from the club. Um, at first, you went on loan to Brighton for a couple of months before leaving for good for Leighton Orient. How did these moves come about? And in your eyes, was there a case of needing a new challenge? What What were the reasons for you to leave Chelsea? Well, the the, the bit about um, um going to Brighton on loan was was quite good. I didn't mind. I, I trained at Chelsea and went to Brighton the weekend. And a fun, there's a funny incident happened in that anyway. Um, so so um, that's I used to so that was good. And and George. Uh, Dave Sexton knew the guy at um, at Brighton, and Dave lived there. So, so yeah, that was okay to to get me, try and get me. Fit. I don't know whether it was his idea, but whatever. But I was okay for that. And what actually happened was that when I was there, Brian Clough and Peter Taylor came. <laughs> so um, that that must so have we, been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that I I may have played. Well, I don't know if I played. I don't even think I played. Two games and he was there, something like that. And I went back. But what what the thing I, I loved was was that um so all the guys are at Brighton. And I used to go down on this Friday night and stay and play on Saturday. And this weekend, uh the all the players were told to go down to the hotel. They were staying there on the Friday night. 
and we were all sitting at a table about five o'clock in the afternoon waiting on it was like the last supper we all around this big square table all the players sitting down and suddenly they walk in Brian Clough and Peter Taylor and everybody's looking and thinking well oh, what's going to happen I was I was kind of okay because I was I was only there for another couple of weeks I was leaving so I wasn't too bad but um, he walked up and the waiter was with him he brought the waiter with him and he looked at the guy sitting at the first I can't remember who it was I wish I did he said to this guy he said uh, and he's accent, I can't even do that uh, what is it you drink, son? And he said, well, no, he said, I don't really drink. He said, no, what, come on. He said, what do you drink when you go out to the pub? And the guy said, a pint of lager. And Cloughy looked at him and said, son, he said, when you go out to the pub, he said, and you drink pints, people think you're a drinker. He said, waiter, bring him two half pints of lager, please. And another time, I think one of the, a little guy called Tony Tanner went out and played really well, worked his, worked his socks off. And he came into the dressing room and Clough was there and he shouted at him to sit where he was and the kid kind of panicked. And he said, bend over and he leaned down Clough and pulled his shirt off his back and said, if you go and play like that every week, he said, I'll end up taking your boots off as well. Very interesting character was Mr Absolutely. Clough. Absolutely. Very interesting character. Was there any sort of part of you that felt that you wanted to stay at Chelsea or was it the, for you the right time to leave? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, then when I came back, um, George said, uh, Dave said to me that, um, that uh, George Petty uh, was interested in me uh, uh, Orient. And a big part was obviously I knew then that he didn't want me and... Uh, a big part of it was that I lived in in London or in North and Kent, so it was okay for me to go there as well. I was probably quite confused, to be honest. I wasn't really sure what what should happen, you know, because I, I was already sort of qualified in coaching as well. Um, and I went there, and it was a bit of a disaster, to be honest. I mean, they missed going up by one point, but they had a chairman there that wasn't a very nice man, so. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> That's fair enough. That's absolutely fine. Um, great to discuss about your career. I just want to sort of talk about current events as well, if, if I can, John. Um, and one part of football at this moment in time is VAR. So just want to sort of get your thoughts on VAR, if, if I can, and obviously whether you believe it's still uh, a good thing for football or not. Um, the, 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 I, I just, I don't know how I got on with it. It's really, really. Strange. My my thoughts are that, to me, if any part of a player's body is on side, then he's on side. Doesn't matter which part of his, his body he is, but if that that part of his body is on side, then he's on side. Simple. And to me, this you know the game's about scoring goals, isn't it? Not about sort of somebody getting ruled offside by a fraction. But if you, any part of your body is onside, then then it goes it goes that way. Do you believe at, with that sentiment that people are are overcomplicating things in regards to the rules with VAR and making it too much of a fuss that it should be? Oh well, well, no. I think I think people are people are doubting because they haven't got it right. The whole thing about not sort of putting the flag up. I mean, now people. I mean, I went to a game last year and I jumped up and cheered when they scored, and, and I see people around. I thought, why are they not jumping up? And, it's, <laughs> and then suddenly it's not a goal. I mean, they, uh, obviously, if the lines the big flag up, we all know it's it's offside, and, or the lines and dodgy, but we'll, we'll let them suffer that. Is um, well, to me, I've always. See, that, see, when I played, the, the referees were the most honest people on the field. Every football would cheat. But the referee didn't. Why would he cheat? And, and they were different characters, you know. I mean, like, referees in my time were, were brilliant. I remember once when Billy Bremner and I were, we had a row a handbag job up at Leeds and, you know, do they want to fight him or do this? And, and the referee went to Booker's and as he went to Booker's, Billy looked at me and he said, ref, he said, we're just two daft jocks. I'm with John. And I said, of course we have Bill. Shook hands with him. And the ref went, are you sure? And we went, yeah, yeah, we're okay, ref. And put his boot back in his pocket and carried on. So. Now, that would not happen now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. That would not happen now. You'd both been booked and it just it would just be 
be sort of brought forward to the FA. And yeah, I think, <laughs> as you say, it will just completely go OTT. Oh, it wouldn't, that wouldn't have, as you say, it wouldn't have happened. Another yeah. time, I think that one was, yeah, yeah. It was, um... Would you get rid of it or would you persevere with it? Um, well, well what, what it really needs is, is a couple of sensible footballers to go and sit down at wherever it is and with a referee and let the footballers who have played the game uh, explain to them then sort of what, what their feelings about it. That's, you know, it doesn't take a lot, you know, obviously, you know. If, but if you see when you're talking about sort of inches, you've got to give the benefit to me, you've got to give the benefit to the striker, to the guy who's attacking. That's what the game's about. That's all. Give the benefit to him. If, um, but but have a have a proper footballer with a referee sort of sitting beside him explaining sort of you know that the how he's tried to tackle you know, the, the, the intention. Most footballers can tell when you're watching the game whether it's intentional or not. Um, yeah, I've done it myself. I watched a bit and I think oh, that was intentional. The, 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 who was the guy in the first first game of the season? I think he got a bit young lad came on and his wasn't intentional, but, but it looked dreadful. I and mean, like it looked like he went right. But he, to me, I thought no, he didn't. He didn't mean to, to, to go over the top. It was so. Yeah, so that that's probably what they need. In regards to especially this season and VAR, it's been one very interesting season for Chelsea. Of course, as we're recording, it's to the build-up of the Champions League final against Manchester City. But the Premier League season has finished. And it's been a pretty much of a roller coaster season for Chelsea. The fact that Lampard left midway through with Tuchel um, taking over. Chelsea losing in the FA Cup final against Leicester. John, just sort of quickly, what, what are your thoughts on Chelsea, especially this season? Yeah, obviously it's been it's been a, a really strange season. Um, I I had actually so sort of, I bought into the the fact of Frank, and I thought that he 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 was going to do it. He was going to get the time to do it, and it would have been all the young kids coming along from the youth team, and uh, and I just don't think he got enough time. Um, but that's it, and um, and and I uh, I actually believe that um, I said something the other day. I think um, the, the the manager to do now is, is is quite lucky. I think we'll find out how good he is next season. Um, I think, and obviously if he's if he's good, then then Chelsea Chelsea, Chelsea I mean, he's got he's got everything there for him. And people talk about so what players need to come in, what players need to go up. I mean. But I can see he's got he's got the whole squad there, and that's, I mean, obviously they can do it. It's whether whether you can get inside their heads, I think, and that's where, where Frank is concerned as well. A lot of the players that are there today should be looking in the mirror and thinking, you know, why why did we do this when Frank was here? Um, because I see the effort now is is gone up by uh, quite a big percentage on on the whole team of of effort. And that's what, they, and um, yeah, well, um, I think, I think, um, yeah, it'd be great. Obviously, you want to win the European Cup next week, yeah. Um, and then you'll see. I think then it'll take another year to decide how how good the manager is, and you know, but it's, it's great, you know. To me, you, you deal your cards, mate. You've got this is the cards you've got. You've got to play them. Absolutely. John, just final question from me for this interview: How do you look back on your Chelsea career? I look back on it, and um, well, I don't look back on it indoors. I've probably got a rollicking now for sitting here talking about it for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I must admit, I, I enjoy I enjoy being on Facebook and talking. But I, I, see, I, to me, there are fans have got more stories, as many stories as I have. I mean, I love listening to some of the great Chelsea way back and the tales that they have to tell. And I love meeting up with them and seeing them. And, and yeah, they've got some great stories. And they're bigger legends than we are, mate. I mean, and they've spent all their money on them. They've, they've done everything. They've followed the club all over the country. I mean, they went to that play back. They got a game and, and clubs are not looking after them. Is it back who they played the final? Who a few game? years ago, yes. Yes. Yeah. And in, in a country where you can't, you're not even going to be able to get there. 
I, I find that that to me is one of the yeah to me the the, the just tremendous Chelsea fans have always been great to me always have been and I know why it is and I know a lot of people kind of say I'll oh, forget me I'll say what was the chip and say when did you play and I'll say in the 60s what's your name <laughs> and I'll say who did you play with and I laugh and I I, I can sit do it so I remember but the, but but real Chelsea fans who were there um um, they know what I think about them and I know what they think about me. I mean, they know that I've always given 100% um, for whatever and, and they've always given me. Um, great. I, I don't, can I tell you one quick story about... Yes, because, of course you can. Yeah, absolutely. Just the last one because um, and way back when the, the crowd used to um, give everybody a clap and they came out. I don't know if you remember that, but they start off with them um, when they came Gave up, uh, start off with Peter Burnett and go through, then it would be Ozzy and then Charlie, and then it's so all the good ones. And so that's when you came out with 10 minutes to go. And one day, Peter Houseman and I were out there standing and we were laughing. And we were saying, Do you think we're a long applause today? Because we were always last, <laughs> or 10th or 11th. That's what it was used to be 10th or 11th, and it threw them on. And, um, and as it, as it was getting closer and closer, and the referee's just about to start the game, I said to Peter, hang on, Peter, he said, what is ref? I said, Peter, hold it off for another two minutes till we get a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it never, I mean, people always say things like, oh, you were under rates and stuff like that, but, but on the field, and we knew what, how good Peter Hudson was, and they knew well, what we did. They all, we all knew what each other did. As I say, the, the bricklayers appreciated the labourers, that is a very good way of looking at it. Absolutely. John, I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on the podcast. It has, it's been a long time coming, but I'm finally <laughs> very, very pleased to have you on the show. I've absolutely enjoyed listening to your stories. And, you know, again, hopefully once this COVID's over, we'll definitely hopefully see you down at the bridge again one day and it'll be a good way to enjoy the football again. Well, it'll be, it'll be uh, I've got some good ones to tell you, but that'll need to be over a, a, a wee drama whiskey. <laughs> Keith, lovely talking to you too, mate. <laughs> John, absolute pleasure. All the best. You take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.